Uh, excited to bring a guest back on the show, number one, because they uh, had a good enough time that they came back. It's always fun. So we'll bring that guest out in just a second. But just to set you up for what we're going to be learning, um, you know, we've got these wearables everywhere, right? you got the, uh, the the Apple Watch. And we've got the Aura and the bracelet. They're just everywhere. What are we doing with this data, right? And what are, what are people in high-performance sports doing with this data? And we're going to talk to somebody who knows about that intimately. Uh, our guest today is uh, well, a returning guest, Matt Tuttle, and he's worked in the NBA and the MLS, and now he's doing a PhD. So he's really going niche down, and he's answering a lot of these questions that a lot of PTs out there might have. So we figured we'd bring him back and just sort of crack open some knowledge. He's just beginning his PhD, too. So we also have to have a follow-up when he's done with this thing to see what other stuff he's learned. But he's already, you know, hand... Uh, hands and feet above the rest of the uh, the profession because he was sort of intimately using this uh, these tracking things. So we're going to do, what are we tracking? How are we using it? And Matt's going to explain all that. But I, I don't want to skip over the fact that uh, as you are hearing this now, if you're re downloading this near release date, uh, a chance to go to CSM, APTA's combined sections meeting in Boston. Lots of learning, lots of people, lots of moving around, lots of parties at night. But of course, that's not why we go there. We go there to learn. And there are parties in it. Um, to go there for free, ATI Physical Therapy has been supporting the show for a while now. You know that. They want to know if you want to be inspired in Boston with them and register now for an all expenses paid trip. This is not a drill. Uh, it's going on February 15th to the 17th in Boston, Massachusetts at the Boston Convention Center. Um, really, no matter where your interests in the profession lie, there's going to be lots of stuff for you in terms of learning and networking in the whole line. Although I hate calling it networking. How about just meeting smart, passionate people? Let's call it that, not networking. So uh, APTA CSM has that. A lot of times people will say, and I understand this, that uh, finance can be a barrier. So an all expenses paid trip is not too shabby from ATI Physical Therapy. So enter to win in the link in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast. That's like the text along with the uh, the download thing, no matter what app you're looking on, Spotify, iTunes, whatever. Uh, or in the description of a YouTube video because we do stream all these to, uh, to YouTube as well. So I, I would enter quickly because the contest is going to end soon, right? Uh, mid Mid-December. So get in there now. Check the notes. Just throw your name in there. What's the worst thing? What's the best that could happen? Let's let's focus on the positive. What's the best that could happen? Uh, also, want to say thanks to our friends at MW Therapy. Sharif and his team come on the show every once in a while to just talk automations and and EMRs and how to get better. They know what they're talking about. You can revolutionize your practice with MW Therapy's all-in-one outpatient PT EMR experience. The seamless integration of patient portals, marketing automations, and billing at an unbelievable value because you deserve that. Switching over to is a breeze. Sometimes people get headaches about that. Check out what they can do. Take a test drive at mwtherapy.com. And our friends north of the border from Physiotech asking if you want to boost your clinic's revenue by $290 per patient per quarter with their remote therapeutic monitoring. Of course you would. Physiotech will help you enhance patient outcomes, ease provider workload, turbocharge your earnings. Kickstart with RTM at physiotech.ca. That's physiotec.ca and uh, learn more about remote therapeutic monitoring. So let's kick off today's episode with Matt. I'm pumped for this. You should be pumped too. Without further ado, let's uh, do this. For now, Are you ready to I'm go? I'm ready. The best conversations happen at happy hour. Welcome to ours. Welcome aboard. This is the PT Pinecast. Here's your host, physical therapist, Jimmy McKay. Hey, that's me. All right, today... We've got some a returning guest. It's always fun when you have people back to the show. It means the first experience wasn't awful. That's all we can say. It wasn't. It wasn't terrible because they said yes again. Uh, today, somebody in the world of uh, high performance sports. We're gonna, and he's he's like answers the questions right because a lot of times it depends. Uh, former head of medicine and performance for the New York Red Bulls, director of sports science and physical therapist for the Denver Nuggets. So that's a cool mix. Uh, nearly a decade of experience in professional sports. So whether you're a sports enthusiast, a PT professional, or just you're just into sports, right? His insights, where he used to watch the games from, right? And everything before and after the games and on the buses, like all that. That's a different aspect. It's a different angle. And we like to find out about stuff like that. So uh, let's get ready to learn from the best in the biz. Welcome back, back to the show. 
Matt Tuttle. Matt, welcome back to the show. I appreciate you having me back. I think this is the third time we did that live one in CSM too. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah. Oh no, no, no! I forgot that one. Yeah. Yes, we did the one. It was like fantasy sports. It was. Yeah, it was in like the. Bar. It was in one of the like, bars. Yeah, at CSM. Yes. Okay. I drink a lot on the show, <laughs> so I don't know if my memory is. Too much. <laughs> I tell people all the time, though, the more you drink, the more the audience drinks, the smarter I sound. There you go. So they should do that a lot. Or or if they're doing this on their commute, because a lot of people listen to podcasts when they drive, I say, I will drink, you drive. That's the way we're safe <laughs> about this. So Matt, first question, always, it's still the hardest. What are you, what are you drinking? Yeah. And then you tell people where you are, because a lot of times people pick beers based on where they yeah, are. Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina now. My wife and I relocated down here so I could work on my PhD. But the beer I'm drinking is Athletic Brewing's Run Wild IPA. Why do I know that? Because they are a non-alcoholic I know craft that. beer. Um, what? Yeah. I didn't know that, that I don't know them. Or maybe, oh, I know the website, yeah, The Athletic. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's no, what no, I know. So Athletic it's Brewing, run? yeah, N-A. Really? So it's, do it taste it good, good? Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I still, I'll still indulge in a nice glass of wine, but it like means that I can have wine and work on my PhD work and not fall asleep. So I'd encourage people to try them. They've got a few. Keep rubbing, keep, keep rubbing it in. You're in Charleston. I'm in upstate New York as we're recording this in November. It's Today was the first like snow mm-hmm. snow for like an hour. And where are you from originally again? You're Syracuse, from New York. So I'm used to that. I know what's up up yeah. there. Yeah, I'm I'm here voluntarily, <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> Syracuse is the I don't know. I probably told you this the first time I was on the show. It's the fur. It's the only city I've ever been in. It's probably because every time I went there, I was drinking beers. Um, it's I feel like when you went from point when you went from someone's house in Syracuse to a bar or a party, it was uphill. Yes. And then when you went from that party back to that person's house, it was also uphill. I don't know. It was like an MC it, Escher. It, the the hill incline feels different when you're leaning forward from the too many beers after the bar, too. I don't know how uh, there was but everything was. It really was uphill in the snow both ways. I don't understand how Syracuse works. But if you've been there, you know, it's a good time. Um, and then there's that intersection where the green light. Mm-hmm. Do you know what yeah, I'm talking yeah. about? Where the green, the light, green lights on top. Like a, a yeah. stop light. Yeah, there's like one, it's like their claim to fame. It's like an Irish neighborhood or like where they do St. Patrick's Day Parade. So normally a stoplight is red, yellow, green, top to bottom. And this one is green, yellow, red, because like green's on top, which is kind of, it's, it's pretty yeah. cute. I like that. It's, it's neat. Um, all right, so let's start with, you're doing your PhD. I'll brag for you. That's pretty awesome. Where are you doing it? Like, what, like how does a PhD work? Because it's super, 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 super focus like you're not studying something you're like studying and in and like creating for sure learning for other people or something yeah right if all right so what are you studying where are you studying give us yeah so i'm studying at a central queensland university in australia uh with dr aaron scanlon yeah it throws a whole nother wrinkle into the whole thing so so you're like wait 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 wait, wait. you're like we had we relocated to charleston so i could do my phd (laughs) from australia exactly well yeah you're gonna be able to do it from anywhere do it from from somewhere beautiful carolina Got it. So I'm okay. uh, doing with Dr. Aaron Scanlon, who's the most published in uh, basketball workload throughout the world. So yeah, I, you know, having spent time in the NBA, was really curious about workload and actually researching it in the NBA. So there's very little research in NBA players or NBA games about workload. So the goal is to look at the last five to seven seasons of NBA data and create kind of a database of what is actually out there. What do we know? What's been done to this point? And then hoping to inform decisions. Because it's really hard to talk about abnormal workload when we've never defined normal on a big scale in the NBA. Like a lot of teams do it. We did it in in Denver. And I was like, here's what's normal for a Denver Nuggets player, three games a week, blah, 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 blah. But we don't know it on a bigger scale. And we like to say big data in sports, but it's not really big data. So We got to get as many data points as possible. So I'm going to get aggregate data from the NBA. We'll publish a few original papers from that. I've got one paper in with sports med right now, uh, looking at intensity zones in other basketball leagues throughout the world. So uh, PhDs outside of the U.S. uh, can be done by publication. So I'll do five original papers, Mm -hmm. write my opening and closing chapters, and that'll serve as my dissertation. I don't understand a lot of what you just said, but it sounds fancy. It sounds it sounds like call me when it's been published. Yeah, I'll send you the articles hopefully. So, 
how <laughs> how does the NBA have this? Like, how does this work? Like, who? Like, you know, I track me. I'm sorry, I have an Instacart uh, update from my, and they're barely coming up around me. I'm showing the camera. I was supposed to show you my Apple Watch. Like, I track, you know, like stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but what is the NBA like? How? Because you said like for me from the outside, I'm just assumed. I don't know. All these players have a thing, a Fitbit, right? The MLS players, which we'll get to, they're wearing the sports bra. They're sort of famous for yeah. that, which has the thing on it to make make sure when they make a move or when they burn a calorie, we're sort of like figuring that out because we want the end to be as big as possible. That's as deep into research as I go, as I know what an end is. Great. So. How little is the big data, or how big is the big data? We, I just assume we know every step on every player, but obviously in, that's not in right. the NBA. We don't. We know very little on every player. So okay. the data that I'm looking at is going to be just in-game stuff. And so players in the NBA actually aren't allowed to wear any tracking uh, monitors in-game. It's against the collective bargaining agreement. Oh, really? Yeah. So in, huh. in know that. each arena, and I'm going to screw up the number of cameras, but there's. 20 or 30 cameras spaced out throughout the arena that tracks every player's movement on the floor. So how far they run, how many jumps, how many shots, and that captures data. And then overnight it produces how much high speed running did a player do? How much sprint? What was their top speed? That's the data that I'll be looking at for my PhD. And then as far as in practice facilities, teams have put in what are called LPS local positioning systems, as opposed to GPS. Cause we can't, cause we're in a giant cement block. Um, and those are ultra wideband. So it's a tiny little sensor that we put in players' shorts or sometimes in like one of the sports bras that tells us where players are within two centimeters of accuracy. Um, so teams have gone to that Crazy. for tracking practice and then comparing that data to the game data. And it's not, you know, it's not perfectly apples to apples, but we're doing our best to get close. And then how much other stuff? Because again, look at this fancy thing I got on my wrist <laughs> and you got the whoop and you got the, whoops, the ring or the, the aura, wristband yeah, the aura or whatever. Ring. Yeah. Or, uh, right, there's all this stuff, and obviously, like Johnny Owens from Owens Recovery Science was like, "Listen, man, where things get pushed forward is where money is, and money is sports and military, right? So a lot of things will start there, so you can sort of predict where things are going to go based on the military and sports. So, like, what, like, if you know nothing about sports data and what people like you are doing." What's being tracked? What do you think will be tracked in the next couple of years? Or and then of course, what are you gonna do with it? Because like again, tracking wh- why Jimmy knows how many steps he took is nice from a motivation standpoint, but these athletes and and, and stuff are doing different things. Yeah, this. and I think you hit on a huge one there. Is like, what are we gonna do Did with I? it? I yeah, sort of <laughs> but like yeah, we we're just collecting <laughs> stuff right now, and that's a little bit of what. Uh, right. Inside of my field specifically frustrates me. It's like, well, teams talk about. <clears throat> how much data they're collecting and well we've got all this and this but like if it's not clean accurate well put together data and it's not actionable for particularly coaches and players i don't care yeah so nice what we're tracking is what we'd call like those external workload metrics uh, which are the how far are players running how fast are they running how many jumps their accelerations and their decelerations um that's kind of their on the floor tracking Teams are then obviously tracking everything that guys do in the weight room. So, you know, teams do it differently. But if you looked at like tonnage or just sets and reps so that you're tracking that. We also in Denver did a subjective monitor. So players would come in every day and they'd fill out a questionnaire about how sore, fatigued, how they'd slept. And that would be another kind of checkpoint in our monitoring system for that. Now, I think monitors gonna, monitoring is going to start going like, even farther potentially to some of these like internal monitors where we're putting chips and data. You've seen like the Elon Musk stuff. Uh, That stuff's not going to sniff uh, NBA players because that agreement with the league of they're not wearing stuff in game means we also can't force players, which I think is, but it's the player's data. So we shouldn't be able to force them to do anything. Uh, But like, they don't have to wear a whoop. They don't have to do this and that. But I think the future of tracking will look at like, more internal devices so you don't have to worry about charging your apple watch or can we start tracking you see the continuous blood glucose monitors that are can we get this kind of stuff going more and more and i think you'll see that expand in military uh probably first before the sports world yeah it's it's just getting smaller and smaller and more reliable more reliable and easier and easier and that's just how things work right like and uh and so 
So I don't know about CBAs, yeah. and that's not your area either. So I'm not going to ask you like a CBA. But like, so I'm I'm assuming that like pr- players probably want to know about themselves too, because like these players are like they know their bodies, they want to know this stuff. How much are how how curious or how into um some of their data are players? Are they like super into it? Like I'd be into it because I'm yeah. like I don't know. I just kind of I don't know. That's my mind. I would say that it's shifting. Like five six years ago in the NBA. Guys were, I'm not putting the sensor on. It's going to get used against me because there were cases that data was used irresponsibly against players in negotiations or bargaining. So uh, oh. they were very guarded against it as the, you know, the old guard is kind of moved out and we've got, you know, every year the league has young players coming in that have had this stuff through AAU basketball, through college basketball. They're much more, right. That's the way to do it. They're much more comfortable with tracking it and interested in it. I will say, in soccer, it was way, players were way more interested in it. They were much more interested in how far they ran, how many meters they were sprinting per day um, than players historically are in the NBA. And the NBA stuff is driven by your stat line and your advanced stat line, so that's really where the players care the most. Yeah. I mean that's the way you do it, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna institute a pitch clock in the NBA, you do it in college yeah. baseball. You know, you work it up because you want to move with that cohort of people, yeah. and it's the same thing. Like, dude, I don't want Geico putting that thing in my car because no. <laughs> I don't want them using me speeding. <laughs> I gotta make up some time and get to grandma's house at Christmas. I don't want them using that against me for my yeah. rates. So I like totally believe. I totally like, I get it. Get the old guy. We're like, you're not, just yeah. that, bro. Like, no. And so we, but then if you're used to it, you're like, okay. Yeah. And so we, I'd counter that in Denver by on the first day of the year, I'd like open our athlete monitoring system, which is where all of this stuff would kind of streamline into. And I'd show it to the players. Be like, look, this is what it is. It's not scary. It's fairly basic. It's nothing that's going to affect your contract. We're doing everything to help you stay healthy, to stay on the floor, to perform at your mm-hmm. best. And then have regular intervals through the year so that players could ask questions and they felt like it was an open forum to tell me that, like, Matt, you have no idea what you're talking about anyway. I'm not going to do your stupid survey. And you're like, oh, well, but here's why you should do my stupid survey. So it helps you. So I think even in the process, educating players so that they know it's not being used against them like that Geico thing. Because we, my wife and I did that and I hated that thing. Yeah, no, no snapshot or whatever. <laughs> like, we, you know when we got nervous, it, or my dad anyway, because like, this was like conspiracy theory before, like the internet was when they started doing like um, uh, Easy Pass mm-hmm. in New York State. I was like, well, they know when you start at Monroe Woodbury, and they know when you get to Albany and distance over time. And I, I remember being like twelve years old, being like, are they going to start giving mm-hmm. tickets based on? And they were like, and they said no, because of course they wanted you to use it without the fear of speeding. But that's not. I mean, they're still not doing that, but also, like, they just want you right, exactly. They just want, they just want a dollar. Never the, government. the government is infinitely, the government is not streamlined and efficient at <laughs> anything except removing its money, removing the money from its constituents. Yeah. The government is very good at that. So it's like, we'll figure out a way to get your nickel. Speed, if we catch you, we're going to give you a ticket, but speed all you want, pay your toll at the bridge and whatever. So, anyway, all right. So, how much. How much this, is this? Let's go back to the useful question. Yeah. Are you able to? Because ultimately, you want to be able to. Pre, well, I mean, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, a crystal ball, right? Like I want to predict when this person should take a day game off or not do something because we understand after an injury, it's a process. But shutting them down for a game or a week, whatever. But then you have to convince humans to do that too. <laughs> Just like, hey, I think the data. Like how much of this, and again, we can have this, this exact same conversation five, maybe not even five years from now, the way yeah. the rate of things accelerating in terms of advancement, but how much of it is actionable now, I guess. Yeah. Cause again, we're just collecting stuff. Because, yeah, yeah. I think it's the interesting question. I think it's, um, what are you using it for? And there's data out there to say like especially if we speak on the nba of like oh players resting for the playoffs this and that like there's not a lot of data to support that that's actually a real thing um i think the best use case for some of this workload data and it's probably some of my bias being a pt uh before getting into sports science um is in the rehab case so that before we would kind of return guys to the court they'd do spot shots they'd run and do shots they'd play some three on three they'd practice and go 
But trying to time that out was really hard. And now we can compare everything to what they're going to do in a game or what they were doing in a practice before their injury. And I think that goes really far to a safer, more appropriate ramp up uh, in return to play. So I think that's the best use case. Um, I think in some cases you can look at fatigue based on what the player is telling you, based on what they're producing on the floor. Um, but even then, that's a little bit of a challenge because if the game, we would track what we would call performance pace um, and the game speed will dictate how players move too. So I can't just be like, well, he's fatigued and moved yeah. less, so we need to give him a day off. Um, I still think your best information right. comes from having good relationships with the players and being able to apply that data when they're honest with you. I know Who you know? shocking stuff. The computer I can't know. tell you everything. I know. Don't say it too loud because they're always <laughs> listening because the Alexa is in the Google Home. Or, but like, we sort of have something, the people. Yeah. For now, again, I mean, I just plan. You know what I did before this episode? The second, two seconds before I got on and poured myself some Chardonnay, uh, I was planning my meal prep with ChatGPT. Oh, I was like, it's a great so way to I have do one it. Little, I have one. I have one little chat that's always open and I'm like, Hey, this, it knows me. It's like, uh, my, you know, I, I exercise, it knows my exercise, uh, uh, estimation, how much I'm doing per week. I'm like, I exercise. So I use my Apple watch. Who's listening to me now, of yeah. course, play it cool. Who's listening? But I use my Apple watch. I'm like, I exercise this much. If I want to, you know, whatever, what's my meal prep. And then I'm like, you know what? I don't like those recipes. Give me new recipes and it'll give me new recipes. Then I go to Instacart again, when I have my meat there on the Apple watch, I go to Instacart and I go buy me this. Like I could be a shut in so easy. I could be a shut in yeah. never leave my house. But the cool part is the real good gains. The real thing is what you're talking about, which is having a good relationship mm. with players on them, getting buy in them, understanding that the stuff you're doing and telling them to, or not to do is in fact, in their best interests. And you're making an educated decision yes. to do that. And you're like, I listen, my goal is to make you jump, run, shoot as long and better as you can. And to do that, these are the tools. It used to be calipers and microscopes. And now it's like Apple Watch. Yeah. Well, not Apple Watches, but the fancy version of Apple Watch and all these. It's insane to me. The cameras, yeah. like you were talking about those cameras, with uh, on GPS, LPS. That's yeah. nuts, man. And it just tracks people. That's insane And, and it's me. going farther. Um they're starting to track like where players' bodies are in space and time, like where their shoulder, their elbow, and their knee are. So Hawkeye got a deal with the NBA this year, and so they're tracking data in-game now too. So I think that brings a whole other like, whoa, what are we going to do with this data? Because it's a ton of data points that are sampling, I think it's 64 hertz, right? So you start thinking about like every player on the floor sampled that frequently. It's like, but to me, the question is how usable is it? And everybody will say, well, you can see – when an injury happened and it's like, yeah, but it doesn't tell us about the day leading up the two days leading up the three days leading up. So I think there'll be interesting stuff to come it's out of it, but it's a, a lot of data to manage. With, and I think we talked about like, I think this is an article somewhere, but you had mentioned it like in terms of sleep and just like how things change and like, you know, sleep, how mm -hmm. big of a deal can it be? And like how, like, you know, when players go to, and we're not knocking, Matt is not saying anything <laughs> bad about like Cincinnati. Or Milwaukee, which, by the way, is a lot oh, cooler. Milwaukee's got some great restaurants. City. Yeah, just don't go in the cold. I had never been to Milwaukee. I had never been to Milwaukee before, but I went with a PT gig, and I remember like go like oh, I'm going to Milwaukee, and I get there, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa! This is it was very nice. Yeah. It felt like it was the butt of a lot of jokes, and I was like, um, it's a super nice city. So anyway, but my but Milwaukee in February and Miami any time yeah. of year is a different game, right? Like you'd get up for that. And we talked about like, what do 24 year old millionaires do the night before or, or when they're in Miami, it's like, they're probably going to go out and they're going to sleep less. Yeah. And like, Oh, by the way, what happens when you lose two hours of sleep? Not a big deal, but that's it's, two yeah. out of eight. Yeah, it's huge. And, and I'm not a mathematician, yeah. but that's a lot of sleep that you have 25% of yeah, your sleep. Yeah, it's huge. And I think in the NBA, that's what we constantly battle with is, tracking sleep trying to maximize sleep uh, and then educating athletes on how important it is because you also yeah. think that post-game teams are flying more often than not so more teams are staying over in cities now but frequently because of that yes because the sleep research is so clear and again players are more educated now uh, than they were in the past just because this data is more readily available and players want to keep making millions of dollars like that so yeah, there's, yeah. Get it. Like, 
earn. For sure. Or your earning potential goes up. So guys are starting to understand that like sleep matters, staying over in cities is good, but there's obviously pushback too. If you've been on the road for 10 days and you're in LA and flying back to Denver, it's like, well, we're going to get in at five in the morning. Nobody's going to sleep because they're going to walk back in their house and their family's going to be waking up. But there's the personal side of it that everybody wants to be back with their family. So you're always battling that in the NBA and then trying to figure out how it affects performance. Um, So we would look at sleep data, self-reported sleep data, and then try and look at like, does it matter on the next practice? Does it matter in the next game? But the data is so noisy and not clean that it's really hard to piece that together. But it's go, but, 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 but what we were saying is it's going in that direction. Like, I love the fact you said noisy because like I say that too, which is like in communications, it's noise versus signal. And like there's people that listen to this podcast right now, Matt, that are not going to know what I'm talking about. So there's this thing called radio and you used to turn the knob and you'd, so you'd be driving somewhere and you'd be either going into or out of the radio station's frequency. And you'd like try to be listening through the kids. These days are never going to know the, joys of having is that the song or is snow it sounds like snow but but that's what social media is right like this is where a parallel it's like there's just so much stuff going on how do you find the good stuff it's the signal in the noise so you can record freaking lots of stuff but you're trying to find what actually matters what can i do the math on or make the computer do the math because we love our computer overlords skynet is going to be coming soon but how am I going to make this useful? Because in the beginning, it's a person moving. And in the end, I want to know what to do with the person. So that the fun part is, yeah, yeah, there's some science. There's crazy cameras in the beginning and the end. There's monitors, whatever. But in the beginning and the end, the alpha omega, it's people. Yeah. So, yeah, where you are now, I think we're at least educated to the point where, like, I don't know what we're doing, but we're we're going to get we're going there. somewhere. Because we've been here. We're going and somewhere. I, I would yeah. say you mentioned, like, for listeners like cleaning up data or like trying to get through that is even as we track a practice session in the NBA, like I would clip or mark off areas that players weren't participating in practice so that that data didn't affect. Oh, so it doesn't do that. Yeah. And then, so I'd mark every, every drill uh, that we would do and I title them so that we could, again, to make it actionable to then go to the coaches and say like, Hey, I know you think this drill is really intense. It's actually way more intense than you thought it was. Or, I know you thought this drill was hard. Oh. Players aren't running as much during this drill as we think they are. So if, we're, if our goal today is to run a lot, like we should not use these drills. So we created a drill database to hand to coaches to say, on the stop, you mentioned the stoplight. So we did a kind of red, yellow, and green system, coded them out contact versus non-contact and gave them an intensity scale. So they didn't need to know what each number meant. It was just like, this is a hard drill with lots of contact. Does that make sense for today? Yes or no? Uh, so I don't want to go past this because I think this is yeah. this is important. So I think what I heard you say was a coach might think something was a seven, but the data says it's an eleven. Yeah. Like they are gassed. Or you think it's a ten and it's a three, mm-hmm. like it's a six. Because as somebody who's been an athlete and a coach, and I want to brag, but I coached holy mackerels swimming <laughs> in Northern Virginia, and we won the championship. But it's very hard when you're standing on the deck or the sideline to judge how hard something is. This is why like people make a big deal about PTs should know how to lift yeah. stuff. Like you can't tell someone to do something unless you know how to do it. Cause like, how do you understand how hard that is? So what I think you're saying is like, so you're recording and this is like a timeline. If you've ever edited a video, yeah. you're looking at data across the timeline, right? And you're saying you were dropping markers when something started and ended. So you'd be able to say, Oh, Whenever this was getting intense, whatever this hand gesture was, whatever we're measuring, that's what this drill was. So whatever, so now we're almost doing like rate of perceived perceived exertion. So like, hey, coach, you thought this was a fifteen mm-hmm. or or an eight. The, the players were losing their minds. Yes. Like and- this is like that scene from uh, from Miracle where the coach is like, "We're gonna do suicides until yeah. whatever." It's like, no, dude, you're <laughs> killing them. Like that murder. So is that yeah. what, so that's what you were doing is you were trying to you were trying to like sort of parameterize yeah. and like break down like I'm measuring this and just so you know this is the drill in time. Yeah. And that's that's important. It is. It's super coach. important and then like <clears throat> there's research out there too on you know 3 on 3 half court 4 on 4 half court games 
look a lot different than three on three full court, right? So three on three and a half court, we're going to have an increased number of cuts. They're not going to cover a lot of distance. Speeds aren't going to be very high. But if you let three on three go full court, a lot of distance traveled, cuts aren't that aren't aren't as um, aggressive. Acceleration, deceleration is not as aggressive. Total distance, top speed increases because you may have somebody just let loose and a long ball goes to try and hit the breakaway. So using that data then to say like, hey, here's what our goal is for the day. And then we'd also, you mentioned perceived exertion. We tracked SRP with players after every practice too. So that coaches could say, hey, I know you thought it was this. This is what the players thought. Um, you know, there's frequently right. disagreement. Not even what the players thought. Yeah, what though, they right? felt. Well, because you can say well, this is what the player's body did, yeah. right? I mean, so that's the fun part is like, hey, listen, I know coaches want to get the most other players. So it's like, I'm going to give you a tough workout. This is going to be a nine. And the players are like, dude, that was a 12. Mm-hmm. And you're like, all right, but suck it up. You're like, dude, the guy's heart rate was yeah. this much above Normal. average. So he was real. That wasn't perceived exertion. Yeah. He was exerting. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, I think that especially in the NBA, looking at heart rate versus total work done. And for the sports science nerds listening to this, whether that's distance, whatever, whatever, right? But like, hey, if we have the exact same session two days in a row, the guy runs the same mileage, has all the same parameters. The gold standard would be like, well, can we look at heart rate and see if there was a difference response? But to get back to the noise point we talked about before, it's like no two practices are exactly the same. If I run two miles and hit the same top speed, which is the data I'm looking at, it might be totally different. It might be a totally different two miles. So that heart rate changes Mm -hmm. a little bit, but yes. I think there's something there uh, to understanding the player response and understanding fatigue. Well, good luck figuring all <laughs> of that out because I understand most of the words that you just said. But that's what a P- that's what your that's what your PhD yeah. is doing is you're trying to figure this yeah. out. Is is and obviously I don't think I need to map out why the, for the audience why this is valuable. It's like if you could figure out the figure out the signal in the noise, you can start to figure out better. You, uh, the data that you're do that you're collecting can predict or help uh, help inform, I should say, the next day, yeah. week, months worth of workout for each player or each mm-hmm. team or how are we? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts apparently to human beings yeah. when they travel around and do a crazy sport in front of a bunch of people and then move to a yeah. different town and move and then do the same thing. All right, uh, can we? All right, let's do a break real quick. Here's what I'll do. Is the PT podcast. Thank you. Very, very nice voice person for doing that. All right. Uh, ATI leads the charge in PT clinical research with more than 900 clinics, achieving top marks in CMS's merit based incentive program. That's MIPS for the cool kids. They're, uh, they're of a team to join for career growth. If you'd like to explore opportunities and find a job to advance your career, try uh, find ATIPT.com. I would like to say a very, it's, like a, it's a dirty word or buzzword. If you're a fan, it's a dirty word. If you're in sports science, I feel like it's a buzzword. I know where we're going. And the word is yeah. load, load management. So this started five, six, maybe, I don't know. I'm not good with time anymore. I'm old. It started a while ago. And I remember I was at least in PT school when load management started becoming a thing. And they were shutting, and I'm going to say what I think it is, and then you fix it. Load management was when teams were like, listen, 20 games left in the season. We know we're going to the playoffs because that's how math works, right? So if, why are we going to blow, why are we just going to burn this guy to the ground? Let's, what if we save him a little bit because humans are humans. So like maybe they're not going to play every day because they don't have to. This is the the equivalent of the NFL, I imagine, would be like, if we're winning by 15, 25, why are we going to play our starters, right? Let's sit some people because recovery is a part of this, right? So I, th- I, but I feel like NBA, which is where you were when this was going on, that was a lot more. And, and because listen, when LeBron or somebody comes to town and I bought tickets six months in advance <laughs> and I'm not seeing LeBron, I'm pissed. Mm-hmm. Right. And I get that the same token, LeBron wants to win championships, not necessarily just games and not, you know, and all games are meaningful, not there are no meaningless games, but <laughs> I'm playing it so safe right here. <laughs> Everything's going to fall apart. But- you, if you don't need it to get in the playoffs because winning in the regular season is awesome, yeah. but like we, we we start in the preseason to win a championship. So that's where load management, which is how can we... So that's how I define it. Now you do a sports science definition of load yeah, management. Yeah, I think this one's so hard. <laughs> um, so I think of defining workload and it's been stated in the research a lot is 
kind of external workload and internal workload. So external workloads, like what we were talking about, what the body does, how far they've ran the physical output where internal load is a combination of like basically biometrics uh, and the stress that went on the system. So I look at those two things as like your components of the first word being workload. And then I think of the management piece as like, I'm trying to maximize players for me to be ready for every game for their best output possible. Very few players play 82 games in the NBA. And that's it's crazy, right. right? I mean, 82 a is a lot. Three and a half dude. games a week for, you know, four months at least. Yeah. Is that what it is? Three and a half? 3.2 oh, wow. to 3.5 games per week from the middle of October to the middle of April is the regular season. NBA and NHL are both 82 yep. games. That's a crazy season. Then you look at baseball and you're like, I don't know why, I don't know who got drunk and decided 162 is a yeah. game or a season. That's insane. 82 mm-hmm. is a lot. Yeah. So, all right. So, for me, that workload management piece comes to how do we manage across the course of the season to look to peak when we're going to the playoffs? Because, like you said, right. it's not that games don't matter, it's that I get judged, the coaches get judged, the players get judged, everybody in sports, the front office gets judged on winning. And so right. for me, it's how do we build across the course of the season, starting in the preseason with the first practice? What does the first week of practice look like? How does it roll into the second week, the third week? So I look at workload management as what's going on across the course of the season. And when you have a good plan in place, then when stuff comes up, you can adapt more easily. So that adaptation could be player X steps on an ankle it's a little sore. Could he go? We're going to give him the next night off because it's the second night of a back-to-back. And if that thing swells up and it takes us four days to get the swelling out, then we're in a bad spot. So I think where it's gotten crushed is where uh, teams are just using it to limit exposure risk. And like you mentioned, the NFL is a perfect example of that, of like, hey, guys are sitting in week 17 and now week 18, now that we have an extra game in the season, right? Crazy. Uh, we're just trying to limit exposure risk. We're trying to limit contacts uh, because if I don't play, I'm not going to get hurt. Right. So like, okay. I think right. that's where the workload management stuff has driven fans crazy. It's like, well, you get paid millions of dollars to play. You just get out there and play and teams and players and players own personal teams and support systems are saying, Hey, if they're a little bit sore here, do we want to flare his tendon up and miss three games? Hey, it's the last game of the regular season. We know our playoff spot. We know who we're playing. Do we want to put out our three best players or do we want to rest them? And that's a balance that doesn't necessarily come from my decision either, right? That's a group decision of like your high performance staff being your medical director, your sports scientist, your strength coach, the head coach, the front office, the player's personal management team. Like everybody has a say in that. And you're just hoping to come to the best answer for the player. I, I didn't hear you mention my fantasy yeah, team. Yeah, your fantasy all, team is not as important. Out. Although I know the feeling I, is a fantasy football I, guy. I forget who it was, but somebody, a player just tweeted, oh, like, I, and rightfully so. Who was? I, I saw who what was? you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah it, it doesn't matter. Who the player was was like, hey, man, like, my, my, my playing through injury. I, your fantasy <laughs> team does not come into the equation. Yeah, don't think about it. Because somebody had tweeted that I'm like, I need you to get like man up mm-hmm. and put your cleats on. It's like, my man, what are you talking? Like, sure. Context, context. It- yeah, but it just sounds like juice. It sounds ultimately, and I'm gonna dumb this down because I'm not that. Sm- it's juice versus squeeze, mm-hmm. right? And there's a lot. There are so many factors into. Yeah. What is the point? What is our goal? But now, now, now we come full circle. Let's use a big PT word, right? Which is goals, which is like, what is the goal? The goal is to have, and I think you said it well, which I want that person to be as perform as well as they can every time they start yeah. or every time they walk on the court or field or ice or whatever, um, or pitch. I learned that one recently. <laughs> it's a pitch. Um, not sure why we'll get into that. Cause we'll talk about less, but is no one's, I mean, really no athlete's going to be a hundred percent every game there's yeah. a way you can't be a hundred no no person is a hundred percent every day but your goal is to say how is the is the juice of today or the sorry the squeeze of today worth the juice of, or the lack of juice tomorrow or when it's game seven of a seven game yeah. series it, like that is how you advance that, that looks really different i think it's an important highlight of like game seven of the western conference finals if your player has a sore ankle or a tight hamstring that you feel like is on the edge of being a grade one to potentially three level type injury, maybe we need to roll the dice at this point. But when it's, you know, 
game 47 nice. and it's the second night of a back to back and you've got two or three days coming up that are going to be off after that. It's like, well, if they don't play today and we can give them four days of recovery, like maybe we can get through this without suffering a two to four to six to eight or whatever long injury. So I think right. for me, the workload management is a new way to describe periodization and then just like layering in sports medicine on top of like good sports medicine on top of it. You can't win though. Cause if you sit someone and they don't get injured, you're, you're right. wrong. And I'm just pointing yeah, out, right. but like the team's wrong. Wow. Well, uh, would have been fun. And then if you don't and they get hurt, what the hell's wrong with that team? What's what fire everybody on the fire everybody on the medical set? So dude, when do you when do you uh, when are you right? Never. Awesome. Great, great, great feeling. It's to be. the uh I think back to boy, probably twenty seventeen. Um I think it was the twenty seventeen season. We drafted two players that were injured and signed a third player that were injured and Twitter was just lighting us on fire all year because of how many games we missed due to injury. And it's like, well, we took an educated guess on these players because we knew they were hurt. We knew we weren't going to get a lot of games, if any, out of them this season. But we're playing the long game, right? And like you said, you you can't win. My wife tells me all the time, get off of Twitter. Mm -hmm. The things people say about you on Twitter do not mean anything. And yeah, it's an interesting world to live in. It's only... (laughs) Well, it's like it's so now we go back to communications, which is like there when you know, when was there ever this much this distance of separation between you and the people who are your fans or biggest critic at any given time, four in the morning, someone just tweets at you and you're like, you're garbage. It's like, okay, well, thank you for your (laughs) thanks for your input, Johnny Hot Pants 527. I appreciate your medical insight into why that the 600 things that you don't know about this person's this athlete's life you know body and whatever workload um so do you have to turn that off like is your wife smart yeah she's like and i I think you know it's there's so much more context than what the fans see right like oh it's not even even, like my my voice in some of these decisions and i think this is good for any listeners that are students or interested in getting into whether sports med, sports science, S and C and professional sports, like we come from such a strong background in school as PTs of like autonomous practice. We want to be able to make a decision, but like you get into pro sports and you are a very small piece of a very, very complicated puzzle to make the decision. Yeah. And so no, the fans don't get that. So it's better to not, yeah. not read it. And you, what are you going to do? Knock on, knock on every door to explain yeah. that it'll take you years. I'll tell you, I'll tell you this much. And I was having a conversation earlier today. I'm doing a presentation at CSM on research. Whoa, you just said you don't know. And stats. I moved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am just doing communications. The person who submitted the proposal is in research. She's like, can you come make this fun? And I was like, no, can it's at five o'clock at CSM or three to five. So I was like, can we have alcohol? And she's like, you're a, you're an autonomous adult. And I said, challenge it. So, so what I said was a couple years ago, I used to emotionally tie myself to the result of the communications that I shared. And this does have a parallel in sports. Trust me, I'm not just going on a tangent. So I used to say something like, back in radio, we're doing an ad campaign for this local car dealership. And the goal is to, you know, they want to sell 50 Fords a week. Okay. So I used to emotionally tie myself to the ad campaign or whatever creative things that I would put on the radio and do whatever. And then at the end, I'd be like, how'd that go? Because I want the client to like that. So they would come back for more because that's how I bought cornflakes and paid my rent. And I used to be very emotionally tied to if we hit it or not, the goal, whatever the goal was. Same is with podcasting. Same, I'm assuming, is sports science, which is like I, and here's the line that I stole from uh, my favorite Peloton instructor, Matt. I forget his last name. Who cares? I make, no, no, no. This is, this is Dennis Morton, Peloton instructor. I make suggestions, but you make decisions. That line on a Peloton cut <clears throat> my emotional ties in a good way to what I did. And I sh- wish I heard this years ago, which is of course what we always say, but you are, and here's the parallel. I make a funny promo or a contest for Joe Blow's Ford dealership. And we say, that's a good idea. Here's the demo. You want to run the ad campaign. It's going to cost you this much. We run it. It either crushes your goal or we miss the goal or whatever. I used to be like heartbroken if we didn't, because I was like, I, I said that we would, I thought this would. Same thing. It's like you're making suggestions on. I think this person, if they go tonight, they're going to rupture. They're going to do damage to their hamstring. So I think we should sit them. We don't, and they don't do it. And oh, who's Matt? Well, you. But you were making suggestions, 
somebody else makes the decision or several someone else's makes the decision. And I think this is why I'm saying this because the minute I move that goalpost to my goal in communication or sports medicine in this scenario is to achieve understanding. You ask me a question based on the available data of what I know now, what do I think? Because there's a little bit of yeah. Matt in this, which is cool. I think this is what will most likely happen or is more probable to happen. But I think, yeah. but it's you made a suggestion, somebody else, that's not me, <laughs> never going to be, I don't want to be, is making that decision. But I think this is a good lesson to learn, which is this life, yeah. man. Like when your best friend asks you advice if they should take that job or not, you're like, well, give me as much data. I'm going to make a suggestion, but you're making that decision. I'm not making that decision for you. And decisions are unfortunately freaking everywhere, yeah. man. They're everywhere. I wish I could just, just give me, make the right one. I have AI. How come I can't make the right decision? Because even AI is like, I'm going to make a suggestion. You make I, the decision. There's so much to unpack there. First, I think like to get to no, get you oh you were just i was like chomping at the bit while you were going uh <laughs> i think the first one for me is like focusing on a really strong process so um i had yeah. a lot yeah. of mentors in my life out even outside like when i was an athlete uh saying like focusing on your process like don't focus on the results because you can't you can't right. predict the future so i think building really strong process in that decision making um in stealing some like military stuff, like what's our standard operating procedure to getting to this decision? We're going to factor in these criteria. We're going to do this. And then after the result happens, we're going to unpack it. Was it the right decision? So I think that's a home run there that you had. Um, and then the other piece that mm -hmm. I think is really kind of important here for people in sports and people out of sports is that not getting attached to game results, I think is really important because in the NBA, if you're mm -hmm. if you're living and dying yeah. with every result, it's like this emotional roller coaster of a season. So like that's a little kind of side note soapbox. Um, but as far as the dis like the result of what happens with a player, for me, I always stratify it as risk. Like I very infrequently try and be like, this is what's going to happen. I'm like, he's a low risk tonight. There's still some I can't tell you. Or like he's yeah, a course. really high, he's, yeah. he's, a high he's a high risk because he is point tender in the middle of his hamstring. He has a 20% strength drop on isometric testing. And he says that he can't, he can't go tonight. He doesn't feel like he can sprint. So he's a high risk. But if the coach, the front office, the player, all these decision makers come together and they're like, Hey, it's game seven of the finals. We don't, we'll get the hamstring surgery in the off season. Who cares? And it's, then you're just kind of hoping because even when you make that recommendation, he's high risk. Like, I want the player to stay healthy. I want them. To, I want my opinion to be wrong. That's a way better outcome is that the player stays healthy and on the floor. Right. Ha ha, Matt, yes. we proved you wrong kind of thing. Right. Great. Perfect. Thank We're on you. the same team. We're all trying to win games. Right. But you didn't ask me if, I, if he was going to get hurt. You asked me what I thought yeah. my suggestion was on the best long-term or whatever happened. Cause okay, again, time is a factor. A again, factor. if it's game 23 of an 82 game season, it's like, well, long haul baby. But if it's like, it's game seven, dude, lay it all yeah. out there. It's like end of a season could be tomorrow. If we don't get there, the, the end of the season's today. So there's a lot of moving parts there. What is your soapbox? You mentioned there was a, so, it was a different. Yeah. Soapbox. I think uh, not like people getting attached to the results. So you see it so frequently in the NBA that like, uh. And in, I would say in soccer, right? I don't think it's basketball specific. Those are the only two sports I've worked in, but people get so attached to the results that it, you know, you get these slingshots like, oh, well, we won a game. So we're going to have three games off or three days off now before what, uh, before the next game or before the next practice or, you know, oh, we, we were terrible last night. We're coming in and running. Um, so coaches reactions can be very slingshotty. And I'm such a process oriented person that it's like, let's scheme out the week and then we can adjust as it goes. But at least we have this kind of North star that we're working towards. Um, and I think it happens. And I use coaches as an example because they're easy for people to relate to, but it happens in sports medicine, strength and conditioning in sports science as well. Is this that roulette thing where people, someone's going to correct me in the comments, but like we base future outcomes on past results so it's like standing at the roulette table. It's like, it just hit red six times in a row, dude. Bet everything you have on black. Because there's no right. way. It's like, well, actually, there is a 50%, well, yeah. a close to 50% chance it will be red again. That's how math works. Because there is one green, right? Two, or two green, green or whatever on a roulette wheel. I don't bet a lot. Yeah. So it's the zeros. So it's like, well, we did poorly. So I need to 
swing the hammer back to the other way. So now we're going to just run mm -hmm. and I'm going to grind you to the ground because you didn't do well when I was nice to you. So now I'm going to be mean, whatever. But you, yeah. So yeah, focusing. Do you know who Marcus Lemonis is? He's, he has an MSNBC show called The Prophet. No. I don't even know if it's on anymore. I watched it years ago when I, I used to watch TV. I don't anymore. Now I just make podcasts. But he broke everything down in business to three Ps, people, product, process. Yeah. And he's like, one of them's broken. If you have a good product and you're not making money, he's like, do you have the right people selling it? I do. Okay, well, then your process. Yeah. So he's like, it's it's this three-legged stool. Like Bar bar Rescue, have you seen Bar yeah. Rescue before with like John yeah, yeah. Taffer? He's sort of the same thing, but John just yells a lot more. Marcus Lemonis is super chill. Like he's a super chill, like Lebanese guy, like very like mellow. John Taffer's nuts. But it's the same thing, which is like something's wrong here. You are a, with John. It's like you're a bar or a restaurant or a bar a combo. And he's like, people like food and alcohol. So there's your, pro but how are you presenting mm -hmm. that? Great. Okay. So there's your product. Right? So do you have like a, just a, a giant jerk, you know, behind the bar? Okay. There's a people problem or what's your process? Do you measure? Do you understand what your profit margins are? No, that's a process issue. That's why you sell a lot of alcohol, but you're not pricing it enough because yeah. your, your margins or whatever. And you're like, so it's, it's, you have to not just steal an MBA term. Ooh, I didn't expect it. You have to trust, trust the process a little bit. Yeah. Because if you keep varying from it, you're never going to be able to know what lever to pull to move that metric way down the line, yeah. which is wins over a season, points over a season, games not missed over a season. But if you're looking too micro, I imagine everything's yeah. – you you, you're over And it's, right. ex it's exhausting. If you bring it back to sports science, I think it's the same way we kind of built the monitoring program in Denver is it was – built piece by piece, season by season to get to all of those metrics. Like if you just rolled into a team that hadn't done any of this and you're like, here, we're going to do all this tomorrow. Like it's not, it's not going to be effective. It's a bad process to go through. Um, and then the players aren't going to like the people in going through it. So yeah, I stick to the process, have a North star and be planning for tomorrow for a week, for a month, for a year from now. Right. But that's where you are now to go back to your signal with noise is like, I think, you know, you're in a lot of noise right now. But you're like, if we keep doing the noise or keep figuring out what the noise is, like, we're going to find signal. And when we hit signal, man, it's just yeah. that it's a hockey stick. Yeah. I mean, I know you didn't work in hockey, but it's a hockey stick. Like, boom, as soon as you find it, boom, it's straight up. Yeah. I, uh, parallels between, parallels between um, NBA and MLS. Like, how was that jump? Like, what did you play again? What were, yeah. what were your, like, what were your so, sports? Like, your yeah, game? so I was a soccer player and a skier growing up. So I couldn't, you know, well, basketball didn't work because I spent all my time on the mountain. Um, from the uh, second snow hit the ground until, you know, there's mud on the mountain with skiing. Where did you ski around Syracuse? So I learned to ski. Yeah, I learned to ski at Toggenberg. Uh, and then I taught and coached okay. skiing in Telluride, uh, Colorado. Uh, yeah, it's tough, yeah, where they actually have yeah, snow. tough life. And if you're not, if you haven't skied in the Northeast, I didn't ski until high school because my parents were like, we don't know what that yeah. is. Like I did it because my friends did it. And then I figured out later and I said this, I was like, oh, ski. Because then I went and skied in, in Utah with friends after college. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing because I was like, <laughs> what is all this very light yeah. night? Skiing in the Northeast, I'm using air quotes, in a pocket, it's downhill ice skating. Hell yeah. 90% of the time, it's downhill ice yeah. skating. Like when I, I fell in Utah for the first time and I braced like I was about, because I was moving fast because the Utah mountains are not Northeast yeah. mountains, they're steeper. And I fell going fast and I was like, I'm going to die. This is going to be a car accident. And I fell into a bale of cotton. Mm -hmm. Like it was soft. <laughs> I never touched. You fall in the Northeast, you hit ice and ground mm -hmm. and it's like impacting on concrete. All right, so keep bragging how you're like out in Tulsa. Yeah, guys. so cool. all right, so soccer was soccer was your jam. Mm -hmm. So going to the MLS must have been. Fun. Yeah, so I did three years in second division soccer before the NBA with North Carolina FC and women's soccer uh, with the North Carolina Courage. So I'd been familiar with soccer. Had worked there, made the jump to the NBA because I think the questions in the NBA are so interesting. Like we talked about, like how do you keep these guys healthy for three and a half games a week with all this travel and get them to be bigger, stronger, faster. Um, then the opportunity came up to go back to soccer to get back to the East Coast. My wife and I were starting a family. So, it you know, the career at some point, family kind of trumps the career decision. Um, but the transition back was certainly interesting because I was bringing with me a whole different perspective than I had in soccer before of 
in soccer before, it's like, oh, well, we have what's recovery? We have plenty of time to recover is one game a week. But now mm-hmm. coming back, it was so much more educated on recovery. And then like spending time talking to and learning from Robin Thorpe, who was working with Red Bull's Performance Center in California, who's an absolute recovery expert. Like, it's like, okay, how do we implement good recovery strategies into soccer where players are like, well, I'm just, you know, I got a week before the next game, I'll be fine. So I think bringing different perspectives from sport to sport is interesting. Obviously amongst the athletes, like you're dealing with a different, a much more aerobic based athlete. And in soccer, you're running many more miles a game. You're running much faster, but there's not the number of accelerations, decelerations, the number of jumps in such a confined right. space. Um, so the athletes look different and there's a certainly a way to treat and work with athletes in those two different sports that are very different. Yeah. Um, is, uh, where, where are you? Are you on the sidelines? Like, cause a lot of times, like sometimes in sports, like the PT, depending on where they are in the hierarchy, cause everything's different. Sometimes you're not even traveling with the team cause you're with whoever's not with the teams. Where were you with, with New York? So with New York, uh, I didn't travel full time. Uh, I was at every MLS home game, but I oversaw all of medical performance, uh, and sports science operations for the MLS team, the USL team and the five academy teams. So I'd be at all the MLS home games, but then was also managing players from 14 years old to 30 years old. And well, not managing directly, managing the staff that was working with them. So this is different. Explain this to me because the show is all about me. The hierarchy in soccer, football, using their quotes, is so there's academy. Like, so it's like baseball is like major league, triple A, double A, single A, w, whatever. And then but like, this is like down to four. It's yes. like, these are, this is a vertical yeah. in terms of like, you get players when they're 14 years old or whatever. And you're like, this is my, this could be our guy. In 10 and that's, years. that's what it is. It's a big, like, Hey, can we bring players into our under 12 team? And yeah. And so they have an under 12, a 13, 14, 15, 17 team uh, at Red Bull. And, so with each of those age groups, now you also have to understand growth and maturation because certain injuries happen at certain oh, times, yeah. strengthening parameters change depending on where uh, athletes are in the spectrum. You have to check these growth measurements on regular intervals so you know what their risk stratification is. So you have to understand everything from there and be able to piece it together because managing those players or workload management for those players when they're going through a growth spurt looks very different than in the MLS, when a guy says they're sore, but we have to win now to make it into the playoffs, that looks like a different, that's a different decision-making tree. And there's a different, you know, you go from, hey, I got to talk to parents and coaches about this to I'm talking to the GM, to an agent, to a player, to the medical staff treating them because cool. I'm, you know, I'm not always, or at the time was not always hands-on with the players. That's cool. I'm glad you were doing this <laughs> me because that's it sounds cold, but that's complicated yeah. as hell because that is a lot of communication and on and and being able to articulate the crazy amount of stuff that you know and also just keep track mm-hmm. of like keep track of oh my it, gosh so that's interesting yeah I'd say for me that was what that was my biggest learning in that space that was my like how do I communicate when is a information need to be delivered appropriately these are a lot of like you know, you don't, you learn communication in PT school, but it's not to that extent, to that many stakeholders uh, in that high stakes, right? When you're talking about, you know, an MLS, a million dollar decision in the NBA, tens of million dollars decisions, like it's a different communication strategy when you are in professional yeah. sports than what they teach you in PT school about talking to one person in a clinic. Yeah. So uh, this is, uh, I was going to say this off the record, but I'm recording this, so that's not how this works. I'm putting together a course to offer to PT programs where I come there and teach communications kind of 101. It wouldn't be 101, but it would be like P- communications for healthcare providers. But I want to draw from a course like this from, do you know Chris Voss wrote a book called Never Split the Difference? Oh, I, just, I just downloaded it. Manager. I haven't listened to it yet. It's, first of all, his voice, I read the book. Then I heard him, I never heard him talk. You know, I never heard, yeah. I just read the book. His voice is exactly what you're going to think. Because he's like gravelly. He's like, hey, listen. <laughs> so the premise of that book is never split the difference. He's like, I went to work and it was like, you have 10 hostages. So like a normal negotiation would be like, all right, so you give me five hostages, you kill the other five hostages, and we'll call it a day. And we'll all go home. It's like, no, 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 no. You should treat every negotiation as if your life depends on it. And the line 
from that book. And I thought, this is one of those things where I thought he said this in the book or somewhere, but I've Googled it. And I think I created this idea from him, which is every conversation is a negotiation for information. And what I mean by that is you're either trying to get someone to understand your information or you're trying to get information out of someone. And that goes for every conversation, loved ones, player to million dollar athlete, player to GM, PT to PT, person to crazy person on the street, doesn't matter. It's a negotiation for information. I either, I'm trying to get you to pay attention and that requires you to give me something. So to hear you say this is like, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a ton to unpack. Yeah. There. And you, <clears throat> the piece that, you know, I didn't, we dealt with mostly American players when I was in second division soccer and in women's soccer, but oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, getting to MLS, we had a really, you know, diverse locker room with Spanish, Portuguese, but you know, Portuguese from Brazil being different than Portuguese from Portugal and the cultures being clearly different from say Spain and Spanish over there to Mexico. Right. So like understanding cultures and there being certain words that, you know, oh, mean yeah. something even through a translator means something different in different cultures or they want to hear things differently or they, they absorb yeah. your language differently or your body language differently. So learning Culture. those skills uh basically on the fly was yeah huge. it was huge and really challenging yeah. but also really rewarding because now i feel i feel more prepared for the future of like okay i can have these conversations but yeah i'm gonna listen to that book i, I said i just downloaded it so i'm pretty excited it's i read very few books more than once i have like post-it notes and highlights and underlines i'll tell you a parallel story from pt school there was a student i won't say her name but she was foreign brilliant she was learning she was doing her DPT in America in her third language, third language, like English. Was her, she taught herself English. So I'm standing outside a practical exam and like, you know how practicals are in PT school. It's like all day, right? So like you just draw a number, we drew numbers and then you went first or last. So I'm pumping her up and I'm like, listen, you're going to do, the, it was an ortho practical. And I'm like, you're going to do the, everybody's all around. Cause she's one of the last to go. And she was like our, you know, we like, you know, we adopted her. She was our girl. And I'm like, listen, I'm like, here's what's going to happen. It's going to ask you a question. I wasn't telling her the end, you know, what was being asked. But I was like, it's going to ask you a question. What I want you to do is answer the question and I want you to stick to your guns. Then he's going to say, do you want to change your answer? Don't do it. <laughs> stick to your guns. Stay with your answer. Whatever your first answer is. And the crowd around me is like, yeah, yeah, you're going to kill it. Yeah. Everybody's just pumping her up. And she's like, yeah, okay. And then everybody sort of leaves and it's like, all right, she's ready to go in. And she turns to me and she goes, Jimmy, Jimmy, I have a, I have a question. And I was like, what is it? And she goes, I don't have any guns. <laughs> I and I'm like, okay, the gun thing it's out. It's out. Forget that. Forget that. Stick to your, stick to your idea. Stick to your, <laughs> because, but it just highlights that the thing that was so obvious to me and the other 37 American born, everybody stick to your guns, yeah. you know? And she was like, okay. Cause she was, so I don't know what this means. And then she was like, hang on a second. What are you talking yeah. about? It's just really, it's just an example of a euphemism that doesn't make any sense. And you are dealing with that, but it also could be a part of your culture or a thing that you think is small to you is a giant insult to someone else, right? Asian cultures bowing or not bowing or how far you bow is a big deal. Doesn't mean anything to us, but you might've communicated something or not communicated something that you did or did not gigantically mean. Yeah. And I, Were there, was there like good translators? Like, was that on hand? Well, so that was interesting, right? Practices? Like you would basically have players be translators for situations. Our ER, one of our uh, team physicians was an ER doc. He spoke Spanish and Spanish, Italian and English. So he was a home run. But even then, like his, how he would explain something in English, trying to translate in Spanish, like isn't perfect. And um, we had, yeah, we had one player right. who spoke uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and German had played all over the world. Uh, so he was he was a huge resource. Like we'd pull him in a lot, and I always joked with him. I was like, "You got to go to the front office and ask for more money." Just tell him like you're doing two jobs in here. <laughs> uh, and they really, that's there's some cognitive load yeah, there. And it uh, so it was really it was really a unique environment to work in and to be challenged by that. And then even you know I'd say yeah. with coaches in front office, a lot of like, conversations are happening in English. But we had German coaches, we had Austrian coaches, we had. Swedish, maybe? Swedish coaches, right? But like, so Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, 
and then South American staff, oh, it's like, oh, these cultures are way different. We have to figure out how to mesh and work together. Yeah. Um, do you, are you ready to do three questions? Do three questions. All right. Three questions. Uh, brought to you by our friends at Jackson Therapy Partners. Embark on an extraordinary patient care adventure with jacksontherapy.com. Perfect for PTs eager to make their mark. Maybe they want to go to Scandinavia. I don't know. You can do that. You have a PT license. I don't know if you can go that far. You go in America. You can go to America. You have an American PT license. Uh, discover where your skills can take you at jacksontherapy.com. First question, you're known for your love of coffee. Where's your most memorable coffee shop experience? Because you traveled all over the place, man. Like, what? You, like anything come there's, to mind? There's pro, there's three for sure. There's there's a distinct three. Case study coffee in Portland. If you're ever there, case study, fantastic. Okay. Uh, Elixir coffee in Philly, and then my favorite, uh, Mod Cup, M O D C U P, uh, in Jersey City is awesome. Right across the ferry from New York, uh, but mm-hmm. they do some really interesting fruity modern tasting coffees so love it uh former guest of the show uh eric legrand who was a uh, Rutgers player who unfortunately suffered a spinal cord injury but he opened his own damn coffee shop called the grand coffee so when i was writing this question i was like you know what i'm gonna slip yeah. that in but eric yeah. getting a uh, good note. uh with all your travels which city has surprised you the most in terms of coffee culture is there someone like do we because some places didn't care now i feel like coffee now is a big deal a lot of places but some places it's bigger than I that. would say that there's still uh, – there's places that surprise me on the opposite end that, like, it's not as uh, distinct. And I'll – Oh, really? Yeah, I'll throw, I'll throw Charleston under the bus. Like, the coffee scene here, there's a, there is a good mm-hmm. spot, Second State Coffee, if anybody's in Charleston. They got a few locations. They roast all their own beans. But it's hard to find really good coffee down here. Um, I think understated and a different style of coffee, like being down in Miami and finding uh, – the influence, yeah, the influence on the coffee down there is very yeah. different than, say, the coffee influence that you're going to find in Portland. So find local coffee shops and figure out the local flavor. Yeah. Well, Charleston's super laid back. You have to figure, like, they're not doing a lot of yeah, caffeine. Yeah, which is hard for me because I'm Charleston. doing a lot of, like, a lot of caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> go, go, go. I, you, I did not drink coffee until after I was done with PT school. I was... 38 years old and graduated from PT school and I still really wasn't a regular coffee drinker. And then one thing on it, I mean, you've met me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you sort of don't like, you know, I, when I work with clients, sometimes they, they're like, how many espressos have you had? And I'm like, I've only had two. And they're like, mm, okay. Cause if I have too much, I'm just like, you can't get me to like focus, focus, <laughs> focus, focus, focus. But I remember the first couple of times I had, cause I just drink lattes. I have like an espresso machine. If you put me on, like a real, like an espresso machine is not a real espresso. I'll just say that. I'm never, they're never sponsoring my show. But if I have a real espresso, I remember the first couple of times I had that. I remember telling the girl I was dating at the time, I'm like, this is great. I can do this. I can do this. Like I sound like Chandler, like on uppers. I was like, oh, I can do this. And she was like, you need, she's like, how many did you have? And I was like, I had one. And she's like, oh my God, you had one. And I was a 38 year old adult and never really got into coffee. And then I did. And now I just, I don't even want to leave the house unless yeah. I had these two. Um, so last thing, coffee blend, what would you recommend? Like what's a flavor that people should try? Uh, so I do can? single, I'm a big single origin guy. So I stay away from, yeah, you know, I'll have blends of coffee, but, um, Colombian coffee is generally my favorite. Um, second state, if you're looking online, second state in Charleston. So I end up buying coffee from a lot of, uh, places around the country. Second state has a coffee called La Reserva, which is a Colombian bean that's very modern and kind of it's good for the show. Boozy in flavor, has some floral notes. It's really like on point. It. I like it. All right. Last thing we do on the show is called the parting. This is the parting shot. Shot. All right. Parting shot. Uh, last thing you want to uh, leave with the audience, mic drop moment, whatever you want to leave. What do you oh, got? Man, I wasn't ready for it this time. I feel like the last few times I uh, I prepped for this. So I think if you're, if you're interested in getting into sports med, sports science, sports performance, uh, to really educate yourself on what it is, what the lifestyle is, the challenges, the perks that go with that, and taking time to figure that out and finding really good mentors in this space. Because it can be a challenging space with lots of ups and downs, uh, but also really rewarding when you find the right group of people to work with. Love it. Farting Shot brought to you by our friends at the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. Matt, appreciate the time doing all that you do. Uh, I feel like we could have the exact same questions and you're going to give just different answers in just a couple of weeks or months or whatnot. So um, we'd love to have you back on the show again. Let's do it again. 
Maybe we'll do it live in Charles. You have to put my arm real hard. I, I like that. Yeah, we can figure that out. All right. This is the best conversations happen at happy hour. Thanks for coming to ours. Like what you hear? Tell a friend or leave a review on iTunes or Google Play. The show today is brought to you by the Brooks Institute of Higher Learning, an innovator in providing advanced post-professional education. The Brooks IHL offers seven on-site PT residencies, including orthopedics, women's health, geriatrics, pediatrics, sports, and neurology, as well as a neurologic OT fellowship, a competitive OMPT fellowship, and a speech therapy clinical fellowship. Therapists that complete a residency or fellowship through the Brooks IHL will markedly advance their knowledge and skills in a specialty area of practice. Learn more about how a residency or fellowship can help you advance your professional development at brooksihl.org. Our home on the internet. PTPinecast.com. Created by Build PT. Build PT provides marketing services specifically for private practice PTs. From website development and hosting. To providing content marketing solutions for PT clinics across the country. See what Build PT can do for you today at BuildPT.com. The PT Pinecast is a product of PT Pinecast LLC. It is hosted and produced by PT Pinecast CEO Jim McKay and CBO Sky Donovan from Marymount University. We talk PT, drink beer, and record it. This has been another pour from the PT Pinecast. The PT Pinecast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present. More on the show at ptpinecast.com.